Welcome again okay. to this session about the US NCI Alliance on, uh, for Nanotechnology in Cancer. We will have an explanation of the initiative and uh, intermediate results of the 15 years of existence of this uh, alliance from uh, its director, Piotr Kocinski. <coughs> and it's nice to see that a few years after the initiation of the National Nanotechnology Initiative in, two, in the year 2000, it took little time to realize that cancer and medicine will be the will be major application fields for, for uh, nanoscience. So we're looking forward to hear your presentation. Uh, uh, it's you now. Okay. Well, uh, good morning, everybody. It's early morning here in Maryland. It's almost noon in Basel. Uh, thank you very much, Patrick, for a very kind introduction. And thank you to you and Biat for really tremendous effort to put this meeting together, despite that we cannot travel, and uh, but we are still able to connect uh, uh, with you through the computer. So what I would like uh, to talk about today is I'm not going to talk uh, a lot about science. I will show you some results. But I wanted to share with you a journey uh, at the National Cancer Institute, which we undertook 15 years ago in 2005, to form a program which will marry uh, technologies and nanotechnologies in particular with attempt to create new diagnostics and uh, therapeutics for, uh, for cancer. I've talked about that at Cleanup in the past. Uh, 15 years seems like a milestone and the parts of the program have ended this summer. So it seems like a good uh, moment and time to give you an update. Mm. Uh, I come uh, uh, from National Institute of Health, uh, which is the largest funding uh, medical agency in the world, I think. Uh, the current budget is about $42 billion. And NIH uh, uh, main campus is located in Bethesda, Maryland, at the suburbs of Washington, DC. But there are also a number of other locations. Uh, the institution is organized into 27 different institutes and centers. And each institute, to a large extent, is focused on, on a different disease. And National Cancer Institute, or NCI, is the largest one <clears throat> um, uh, with a uh, budget over $6 billion a year. In general, NIH's mission is to create a new knowledge that will ultimately lead to better health for everyone and will help to prevent, detect, diagnose, and treat disease and disability. So it's a very noble mission. Uh, NIH has been around for a long time and Despite uh, budget pressure, it has steadily but modestly increased its budget. So as I said, NCI is one of the institutes within <clears throat> NIH, is the largest one. Currently, the budget of the institute is about $6.1 million, a billion dollars a year. Uh, the orange bar in that uh, graph which you're seeing right now is additional funding which uh, has come uh, through so-called Moonshot Program or 21st Century Cures Act, which uh, has been enacted for seven years and it ends in 2023. Um, <clears throat> of course, majority of efforts which are funded by National Cancer Institute are focused on cancer biology and clinical work. So bringing engineering or, or material science uh, and new technology or nanotechnology concepts have been always a challenge because of different language, the scientists from different areas speak and hope for building a common language which ultimately can lead to working together and uh, uh, doing great things as, as part of the team science. But uh, the importance of technologies and physics has been recognized uh, by NIH or NCI early on. Uh, you see here at the bottom, Harold Varmus, <clears throat> Nobel Prize winner and uh, NIH, former NIH and NCI director have talked about that over 20 years ago. 
the upper publication I think is interesting to to read was uh, uh, written by uh, Yuri Lazebnik <clears throat> and titled "Can a Biologist Fix a Radio?" And that really relates to the fact how how different uh, our backgrounds are and and language uh, or approach to solving problems, but ultimately marrying these uh, different uh, approaches can lead to to new discoveries. Um, how nanotechnology came to <clears throat> NCI and to funding agencies within the US government in general. Uh, that's a uh, funny cartoon, <clears throat> which shows that small things can eventually become much bigger. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> about 20 years ago, uh, or more, uh, during uh, <clears throat> Bill Clinton's administration, uh, the US government formed National Nanotechnology Initiative Act uh, and that uh, organization NNI has, which brings together efforts related to nanotechnology in all uh, relevant government uh, agencies has been continued uh, ever since. As you see, uh, the amount of uh, funds which are uh, <clears throat> being operated under umbrella of NNI is about one and a half billion dollars a year. Uh, and of course, uh, the early on, the agencies which uh, put most of the funding into that were NSF and DOD, where a lot of materials innovation was needed at the early stage of developing nano devices, nano particles. Uh, NIH started on a little bit later, and naturally, that only occurred when new uh, nanotechnology applications have been uh, possible, uh, especially applications in, in medical environment. Um, but as you see, currently the portion of the funding uh, related to nanotechnology uh, and associated with NIH <clears throat> is uh, the largest among all agencies and it's about $450 million uh, a year. Um, <clears throat> and uh, funding uh, um, related to nanotechnology in different institutes uh, um, within NIH is being spent in different ways. There were three larger programs which uh, involved large academic uh, multidisciplinary teams, and they were funded by NCI, National Cancer Institute, NHLBI, Na uh, <clears throat> National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, uh, and so-called common fund from the office of the director of NIH. Uh, the last two uh, lasted 10 years, our uh, alliance program within NCI is still uh, ongoing. <clears throat> so really the, our thought when this program was uh, being started uh, was to, on one hand, look at uh, uh, what possibilities and opportunities nanotechnology has in uh, treatment or prevention of cancer uh, and look at it, of course, from this perspective of fundamental understanding uh, of how uh, nano devices, nanoparticles interact with biological systems, uh, but at the same time, uh, look at possibilities and opportunities of translating these technologies to more practical uh, clinical uh, applications. In the last 15 years, NCI invested uh, into this particular program, which we call the Alliance for Nanotechnology in Cancer, close to $400 million, and that amount was heavily leveraged by additional funds from philanthropy and industry, and I will show you that later. So in, in, in a broad sense, we were focused on, on, on three different areas. One was looking at early detection and diagnosis, whether it was uh, based on in vitro assays or um, in vivo imaging techniques. Uh, the other one was multifunctional therapy therapies of different modalities and uh, also possibility of <clears throat> contributing to, uh, to uh, prevention. There were different flavors of, uh, of funding which were dedicated to that initiative. The one which probably most uh, of you may have heard were Centers for Cancer Nanotechnology Excellence or CCNEs. Uh, which have been ongoing for 15 years and have ended uh, this summer. And they 
uh, were and are still accompanied by smaller grants, which we call Innovative Research in Constant Nanotechnology, uh, training awards, and also importantly, intramural uh, lab, nanotechnology characterization lab, which uh, <clears throat> Uh, does preclinical uh, characterization of nanomaterials. Um, so this funding uh, resulted in really very strong output from both uh, perspectives, scientific output in terms of publications. Uh, also, uh, more importantly, or equally importantly, a number of companies which have been formed to uh, commercialized technologies which were developed in academia under the umbrella of this program. We can count up to about 130 of industrial entities uh, and they have been engaged since then to uh, into over clinical trials, 20 clinical trials associated with nanotherapeutics or nanodiagnostics. Uh, uh, premier uh, academic centers and institutions around the United States were involved or are involved in, in, in CCNEs. And you see the list here as everything at uh, NCI, they were funded on uh, five-year uh, schedules. Uh, so we had three different phases of the program. And <clears throat> as with any new uh, programs, initially CCNE funding was a major portion of non-technology funding uh, within NCI as you see on the graph to the right. And gradually that amount uh, uh, <clears throat> got smaller and smaller from face to face simply by expanding interest of uh, researchers in the field of nanotechnology and also bringing their ideas through uh, so-called investigator initiated uh, concepts and being funded by other mechanisms that CCNE. At the beginning, I think we have done uh, some soul searching where people who had viable nanotechnologies were trying to look for the uh, proper applications for them. Uh, so a lot of work was still developed, uh, was still focused on, early on was still focused on nanoparticle development um, and uh, technology platforms which could be applied in white uh, <clears throat> aspect to solid tumors, but with time, uh, this program became much more strongly biologically and oncologically driven where uh, people were defining compelling uh, cancer biology problems and looking for uh, suitable nanotechnology solutions to that particular program problem. And that was desirable uh, evolution of the problem. Uh, that was reflected in our uh, uh, strategic plans, which we have published every five years. That could be an interesting uh, read for you. Uh, they can be found uh, online. As you see that uh, new innovations in, in cancer biology, as well as maturity of the use of nanotechnology in um, medical applications, cancer applications also reflected what was the uh, focus or different areas of interest of uh, investigators working in this program. Initially, uh, a lot of these grants were focused on in vitro diagnostics and uh, uh, therapy related to uh, deliver of small molecules, but gradually other uh, uh, more contemporary approaches to therapy, whether it was gene therapy or immunotherapy, uh, as well as uh, uh, imaging started to emerge. Uh, so essentially the applications of nanotechnology or, or interest of our investigators moved with the general interest of diagnostic or therapeutics within cancer uh, field. And I think what was interesting to watch was how uh, people from different communities, which I talked about earlier, uh, started to work together and also publish together and actually migrate uh, uh, away from their initial uh, scientific uh, interest or, or, or backgrounds. And uh, we made this uh, uh, simple graph a few years ago when the upper portion of the slide is uh, uh, dedicated mostly to uh, researchers who were uh, more uh, operating in the space of uh, nanomaterials uh, or chemistry and material science. Uh, and were publishing mostly in, generally speaking, in nanotech, and that's depicted in red. 
but gradually with time in, uh, if you move uh, <clears throat> uh, towards the bottom of the slide, uh, there's portion of the uh, publications related to the use of nanotechnology in, bio, uh, in medicine or biomedical application, which is depicted in blue, grew. Uh, the bottom part of the slide uh, depicts the opposite, people who were uh, related mostly to uh, <clears throat> Uh, cancer biology or clinical applications uh, and were publishing mostly in, in, in biomedical space, gradually uh, with time and involvement in this program uh, started to also publish in, in technology journals. So I think that was a proven indication that multidisciplinary science really works and uh, different approaches melt together uh, uh, to produce new innovations. As I also said, a uh, number of people involved in this program uh, started uh, uh, small companies which were commercializing the technology from uh, the, their academic labs. And you see a very long list here. Some of these companies are one person companies, but some of them grew to mid size and uh, uh, in, got involved in, in clinical trials when we count to more than 20 uh, so far mostly phase one and phase two. Um, I mentioned that earlier as well. I think that the NCI investment was really rewarded by very entrepreneurial uh, researchers whom we funded. And in this graph, you see uh, <clears throat> funds uh, related to only four CCNEs, which were funded in all three phases of the program, Stanford, Caltech, UCLA, Northwestern, and University of North Carolina. Our cumulative spending uh, on the centers was about $160 million over 15 years. But you see, and that, that's shown by the uh, uh, black curve at the very bottom, you see that uh, they brought uh, to the universities also a fair amount of funds from different grants, whether these were government funded grants or philanthropic grants, and that's depicted in blue. And the companies associated with their technologies raised significant amount of money from different sources uh, <clears throat> and that's uh, cumulatively depicted in in red so each nci dollar uh, was benefited with probably an uh, additional uh, seven dollars from other sources which allowed to really take this work much farther than uh, if it was only funded uh, and related to the government funding <clears throat> as you see uh these are the few uh, images from our first investigator meeting in San Diego in 2006, almost 15 years ago. Uh, many of those, and you probably recognize some of the faces, Joe De Simon, Jim He, Song Jedi, uh, and myself and my colleagues from NCI. Uh, uh, we moved on in terms of uh, <laughs> our age and years, but we are still uh, involved in this program. And it was really a pleasure to work with so many talented uh, researchers around the country uh, under the umbrella of, of the Alliance. Uh, we celebrated 15 years, as you see, with a, a large uh, cake and small particles when CCNEs were uh, coming to an end this summer. Uh, some of you may have read these articles, and that uh, article, I think, was uh, looked at by Biat last year, and that triggered really an uh, invitation to do this summary. Uh, some of uh, uh, observers and researchers viewed that uh, uh, transitioning from CCNEs to other smaller grants uh, have not been desirable, that NCI should have continued uh, these large multidisciplinary centers for much longer. Uh, others uh, uh, felt that actually that's the right approach because a uh, number of uh, other people will, uh, <clears throat> with smaller grants can contribute to the field as well. We uh, put our five cents in this editorial. Uh, uh, and I think gradually now uh, we settled into uh, the, the slightly different but equally rewarding and productive uh, mode of operation. I think what is worthwhile to note that uh, during uh, the time of uh, CCNE's existence, number of uh, applications to other 
uh, <clears throat> uh, other uh, modes of funding within uh, MCI and the workhorse of that funding is so-called R01 grant has grown significantly from about 200 grants 10 years ago to over 700 grants and most recently a number of R R01s which use some kind of a nanotechnology approach right now constitutes almost 10% of all R01 applications coming to NCI. Um, currently, uh, we have different funding opportunities as you see here, which range from early discovery to translational um, uh, stage. Uh, and we are still receiving a strong, very strong interest and a number of applications uh, to these opportunities. And we are continuing uh, <clears throat> work is similar, work in similar fashion, uh, but community is built in slightly different way. Uh, important component of our Alliance program is NCL or Nanotechnology Characterization Lab, which uh, has done a great job uh, over 15 years looking at different uh, nanomaterial uh, formulations from uh, different labs around the country and around the world, whether they are academic or um, industrial or government. Marina Dobrovolskaya uh, is a co-director of this lab uh, along with Steve Stern, and she will uh, uh, later on have a session on immune modulation by nanomedicines in the cleanup meeting. And I put, uh, the footnote here to remind you about this session. Uh, as you see, the number of different nanoparticles which have been characterized by NCL have been really, really large. Uh, and I think again, what is important to note here is to look at uh, <clears throat> how flavor of nanoparticles which have, have been characterized by them changed. Uh, a lot of liposomes at the early stage, more and more polymeric, uh, uh, nanoparticles uh, most recently, and that really uh, uh, is in concert with where the interest of uh, nanomedicine uh, mm, mm, is being focused and, and moving along the years. Just uh, to give you a few uh, <clears throat> more comments on how we see uh, progression in, in nanomedicine and what we think uh, we should be doing in the future. And of course, a lot of that is being discussed in number of more deeply scientifically focused uh, uh, presentations at this meeting. If you look at number of publications in PubMed, uh, which uh, can be found uh, using keyword nanoparticle, uh, these numbers essentially exploded in last 20 years from almost none in year 2000 to over 25,000 most recently per year. So that's that's tremendous. And that shows the potential of the field and also shows the interest of people being involved in this field. And that, uh, so there's no doubt that a number of uh, researchers who are involved in this uh, space and an amount of uh, new results being produced uh, has been growing uh, very quickly. Uh, question is, and of course, uh, I don't think we have a uniform answer to that is, are we uh, finding compelling cancer applications for these technologies and are we translating them uh, fast enough to the clinic um, in an informed and successful uh, way? <clears throat> and what else we can do to enhance the presence of nanotechnology in, in the clinical space? As with any new technology, I think that at the beginning, when the field starts, the expectations are high and somewhat naive. That was the cartoon which was made at the very beginning of the program. And as you see, that nanotechnology uh, was viewed at that time uh, as something which could solve a lot of medical problems and uh, will create a healthy uh, individual in no time. And we're in 2020, it's not reality, but it's, of course, as we medicine in general, I think that's what we strive for. This slide was made for a high school presentation, but I think it's, it's a, a good perspective on how we look at the introduction of new technologies and then with reality check, uh, we have to, to some extent, uh, at least adjust our uh, expectation. But at the same time, we should be definitely proud of what has happened with the field in the last 20 years. And this is the number of different uh, therapies uh, which have been approved uh, 
in the US and also other countries around the world uh, for the use of nanoparticle based uh, strategies. Uh, most of them are liposomal, not all of them. Um, and I think that's the, uh, the general status of the field that uh, first generation nanoparticles have been moved forward. In many cases, they were used to uh, deliver small molecule drugs. Uh, definitely, they demonstrated uh, reduction of side effects of the treatment and modest improvement in survival. And I think that's the focus and expectation of the clinicians that, that survival in the future with new nanotechnology-based <clears throat> approaches could further improve. Uh, and, uh, and from that perspective, on one hand, quest for new nanoparticle designs, on the other hand, quest for new application is obviously still ongoing. Uh, I borrowed this uh, slide from Alberto Gabizon, who spoke uh, at CLINAM yesterday. And that's, I think, where the field uh, uh, is moving, that uh, <clears throat> on one hand, uh, some of the drugs which have been approved before were formulated using nanoparticles and, and showed some um, benefit of that. Uh, uh, nanoparticles can be also used uh, for the uh, reformulations of drugs which were too toxic to deliver um, in, in free form, and that has been happening as well. Uh, but there is also also expansion of, of uh, attempts to uh, use nanoparticles to deliver uh, different classes of <clears throat> uh, of drugs or agents, uh, gene therapies using deliver of nucleic acids, a uh, number of uh, demonstrations in immunotherapy. Uh, and uh, different modalities like radiation or hyperthermia uh, enhanced by use of nanoparticles. And of course, uh, the combination of different therapeutics, whether it's multiple drugs being packaged in nanoparticle on, on one nanoparticle or different modalities, whether all of them or one of them is <clears throat> based on nanoparticles. So I think that the opportunities are, are a little really very broad, and we really uh, should use the driver and guidance from clinicians where these best opportunities exist. Um, we're trying to capture that in the paper two years ago. Um, uh, these expanding opportunities of, of nanotherapeutics have been also nicely captured in a recent paper by uh, Tuan Lammers, uh, who, uh, along with members of his group, uh, shows here number of different modalities where particles can play uh, <clears throat> a positive role. I think what is important uh, in context of uh, unfortunate COVID-19 pandemic, uh, and it's important to note that uh, uh, with the race uh, towards uh, <clears throat> producing the effective vaccine against COVID-19, um, three of them uh, are uh, based on uh, nanoparticles to our mRNA-based uh, vaccines from Moderna and Pfizer-BioNTech and uh, another uh, approach from Novavax. And this shows the list uh, current as of yesterday of uh, <clears throat> vaccines which are in phase three or two slash three clinical trials for COVID-19. So again, that's important for the field of nanomedicine and if these uh, developments will be successful, that they will definitely strengthen the presence of nanotechnology in, in medical applications. I think what is also important to recognize that, of course, on one hand, we don't want to build nanoparticles which are too complicated to produce in a reproducible way, but there are a number of different uh, materials properties which could contribute to the therapeutic effect in addition to being just a carrier. Um, and I think that uh, in novel designs of the particles needs to be recognized as well. This is the recent paper from Biomaterials, which we wrote uh, to, uh, to further uh, that thought. Uh, and that uh, new generation nanoparticles have been already moving uh, to uh, <clears throat> uh, the clinical trials. And this is just a small example uh, which comes from the investigators funded by uh, other, uh, our programs, spherical nucleic acids from Chad Merkin at Northwestern University, which have been used uh, 
uh, for, um, I'm sorry, for uh, gene therapies and immunotherapies, C dots from Michelle Bradbury's uh, lab in collaboration with Uli Wisner from uh, um, uh, Cornell to uh, uh, delineate uh, tumor margins and nano metal organic framework particles from Wen Bin Lin at the University of Chicago. Um, just few slides, and again, a lot of that will be discussed or has, have been discussed already, uh, where these general opportunities are, are delineated a little bit in more detail. I think right now, a lot of uh, uh, people are looking uh, uh, to immunotherapy and uh, using nanoparticles there uh, for combined delivery of uh, vaccine antigens and uh, adjuvants and other immunostimulatory molecules uh, and uh, doing it uh, for immunotherapy al alone or in combination with other treatment modalities. And again, spherical nucleic acids, uh, which I mentioned before, have uh, found uh, the opportunity there. Uh, and even looking farther into more specific details of how delivery of antigen and adjuvant, um, depending on the design of nanoparticle, can make the response more effective. Uh, this is really not uh, effort funded by uh, by uh, Alliance, but I think it's worth to mention uh, in these other uh, modalities, uh, this uh, work from Nanobiotics in France, uh, who used uh, heavy uh, metal particles, hafnium nanoparticles for enhancement of, uh, of radiation, and that has been approved in Europe more, uh, fairly recently for soft tissue sarcomas. Uh, Michelle Bradbury and Uli Wisner worked on C dots, which are basically silica parting encapsulated fluorophores, uh, and they have been used for delineation of <clears throat> tumor margins and uh, lymph nodes. Um, and again, that uh, can uh, uh, enhance the uh, effectiveness of the surgical remove, removal uh, of the tumor. And finally, I think uh, that uh, probably don't talk a lot about. Uh, a lot of nanomedicine meetings, but there are also uh, uh, interesting uh, solutions uh, uh, in in vitro space uh, um, for devices which can <clears throat> capture circulating tumor cells or uh, circul circulating tumor DNA, and then downstream uh, um, provide genomic or proteomic analysis of them. This is just one example from Chenarat Seng's work at UCLA. Uh, <clears throat> question is, of course, how these uh, innovations uh, can uh, move effectively to the clinical space. There were some criticisms that uh, that hasn't been happening uh, effectively enough, or that impact in the clinical in the clinics uh, because of the modest improvement in survival has not been as high as expected. This is a nice paper uh, uh, written by. Uh, you're from AstraZeneca and also uh, uh, academics to propose few uh, possibilities how to improve the effectiveness of clinical trials, uh, whether it's to uh, use the driver of the clinical application uh, towards the design of the particular trial rather than pushing technology into many different, the same technology platform into many different applications to also using companion diagnostics to employ uh, patients uh, stratification uh, prior to enrollment in the trial. So I will leave you with the list of number of uh, areas which we think uh, that uh, nanomedicine will make, is making or will make an impact uh, and, uh, and strategies which we think are useful. And I'm sure uh, there's a lot of overlap between this list and what uh, is being discussed at the meeting uh, already. Uh, but I thought that could be a useful summary. I will stop here. I wanted to thank uh, uh, organizers again for the opportunity to speak. And if there are any questions, I will be happy to answer them now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your interesting talk. I have one question. Sure. This is the impression that the notion of converging sciences, say the rapid advances in artificial intelligence, the human genome uh, genomics, 
they play be best in concert with other technologies like nanotechnology? Is there such an integrating, integrating strategic view from the NCI or a program or a vision for the future? Or will future effort remain relatively uh, lone standing, individually separated in uh, structurally and strategically? Uh, that's a very good question, uh, Patrick. So our view at NCI is that when the new field starts, like we started the NCI Alliance for Nanotechnology 15 years ago, there is a need of boost of some creative and innovative funding approaches to bring people from different disciplines together. And artificial intelligence 15 years ago was obviously not as rapidly developing uh, as, as now. Gradually, when these teams are built, um, there are a number of different funding mechanisms within NCI or NIH, which could support um, multidisciplinary work, but are not explicitly dedicated to nanotechnology. And that's the transition which, which we're being in right now. <clears throat> and uh, um, these mechanisms not only cover multidisciplinary work of different of academics representing the different fields, but also collaboration between academics and uh, and people from the industry. We have program on academic industrial uh, partnerships, such that when when field reaches certain level of maturity, the uh, diversity of funding which uh, uh, researchers working in this field can apply for growth and broadens and, and that's what's happening now with nanotechnology that a lot of people who were uh, brought to NIH or NCI because of this program 15 years ago now became full-fledged NIH investigators and, uh, and are applying for a number of uh, different uh, types of grants. I think what is also interesting to know that number of engineers or chemists who, uh, again, uh, <clears throat> came to medical space through this program now became a member of National Academy of Medicine. Now they are being recognized for their innovation and contributions to the medical space, even they are not medical doctors by training. To medical space through this program now became a member of National Academy of Medicine. Now they are being recognized for their innovation and contributions to the medical space, even they are not medical doctors by chance. To medical space through this program now became a member of National Academy of Medicine. Now they are being recognized for their innovation and contribution. Thank you very much for your insight. Now I'm checking the questions from the uh from our question list, but I have not yet seen a specific uh, question coming up to this to this setup, but I'm sure our uh, ability to communicate digitally will allow uh, to uh, have interactive one-to-one uh, -one discussions in the next short time also. So I give the uh, lead back to to, Pinam, uh, to, to Beat. Well, thank you again. And of course, you know, if there are further questions, uh, uh, you you have my email address, and I'm sure people who will be asking questions like that can come uh, can uh, contact me directly. So thank you very much again for uh, for inviting me and and uh, allowing me to make this contribution.